Buddy, the ugly gingerbread boy. The skies were the color of generous chocolate milk with clouds of bright cotton candy. From those clouds, like a welcome summer drizzle, came gummy bears. There wasn't a corner of Candyland where you couldn't bend down and grab a handful of the chewy treats to prolong your sugar high. You could eat gummies off the street and no one would yell at you. My mother didn't believe in heaven. She believed in the blinding light of an interrogation room where every soul was observed under the searing lens of religious dogma. Sugar was sin. Television was sin. Imagination was sin. The ice cream tipped skyscrapers of Candyland would occasionally drip creamy goodness down to the licorice paved streets below, but their true appeal was on the ground floor. Behind their caramel glass windows there were televisions, giant screens of bright color that would beam exciting, forbidden cartoons out into the world for me to watch. I would spend hours behind those storefronts, licking the glass, indulging in the stories that mother considered to be the work of Satan. School wasn't any better. At first I was excited at the prospect of a place where I would be free of mother's fanatic raving, but Chelsea Steeler made sure that my suffering wasn't solely contained to my house. She should have been in grade 3, but she was still in grade 1. Three years don't make much of a difference in the adult world, but they do in the realm of children. They make a big difference. She was a head taller than anyone else in the class. She had the reach of a prize fighter. She had the jawline of an adult. She was also mean. Really mean. Beyond the bright screens of the televisions there were dark alleys of dark chocolate, and in those dark alleys handsome men in long flowing trench coats stood and mumbled in dark soothing tones. They told me jokes which I did not understand, but I laughed anyway. I knew the jokes were dirty, and I knew mother would disapprove, but I also laughed because it brought a smile to their dark chisel faces, and bringing joy into the world made me happy. I knew they loved me. Everyone in Candyland loved me. In Candyland I have friends, and with those friends I would laugh and dance and sing and go on adventures, but sometimes, when I needed to be alone, I would climb up on top of one of the skyscrapers and watch the world beyond the city. Out in the marshmallow hills there were long-legged spider creatures of stiletto heels and breasts. The majestic animals roamed the world and breathed big tufts of orange smoke into the sky from their pink-tipped eyeballs. On the windy days, when smells of the candy-coated nature traveled through the city, you could smell the gentlest hint of cinnamon in the air. I spent most of my childhood in Candyland. It was the only place where I could find respite from mother's fire and brimstone preaching and Chelsea Steeler's angry fists, but the older I got, the more I realized that escaping my miserable life through daydreams wouldn't change anything. When I was young I didn't think there was any amount of candy that would make the suffering end, but I was wrong. The tired announcement from Mrs. Abbasi about the last day of classes before winter break was accompanied by a lively parade in Candyland. I would be forbidden to join the class on the end of the day field trip to the Natural History Museum. Mother refused to sign any permission slip that would lead to me seeing dinosaurs, but a celebration was still in order. Before the field trip the class would gather in the home ed kitchen and bake gingerbread men. The concept thrilled me to my tiny seven-year-old core. I would get to use my hands and my imagination to make something. I would get to design my own little gingerbread man. I would get to design my own little friend. Marching bands of ginger folk filled the streets of Candyland in celebration and when I wasn't dancing or singing from the sheer joy I felt in my heart I was surrounded by sugary suitors. They all suggested that I paint their face on my new friend. They were all beautiful and I told them that, but deep inside I had already chosen the smile that I would see on my gingerbread companion. I had already chosen his name too, he would be Buddy, the gingerbread boy. He couldn't be a man. A gingerbread man would be too big. If I had a man in my room mother would find him and crush him to little bits before the week was over. No, Buddy would be a tiny gingerbread boy, a friend that I could tuck away in my bedstand drawer and hold for safety if mother's feverish midnight prayers ever got too scary. When the day of the gingerbread came my hands were steadier than they ever were in any arts and crafts class. I wanted to make sure that my new friend would be perfect. As I worked away at his blue frosting pinstriped suit the rest of the classroom disappeared. The arguing kids, 
the cheesy Christmas music, Mrs. Abassi reading a newspaper by the desk, the outside world faded away and I was left alone with my masterpiece. I was going to make him so beautiful. He would have the brightest smile and the biggest eyes. After he would be done and dolled up everyone would say, wow, what a handsome gingerbread boy. But no one outside of my imagination has ever said that. Just as I was about to start applying frosting to the gingerbread boy's face I felt a sharp pain in the back of my head. Reality was dragging me back out of my imagination in the form of Chelsea Steeler's heavy fist wrapped around my hair. Within seconds I was down on the floor and looking up at the third grade giant observing my tiny friend. I got up and pleaded with her in strained whispers to leave the gingerbread boy alone. I told her that he didn't do anything to her, that there was no need for destruction. She ignored me. Instead, her big dumb eyes drifted from my faceless creation to the jagged mess of red frosting on her table. I begged her to leave him be yet she refused to listen. Instead, she grabbed the tube of frosting that I had used for Buddy's red shoes and squeezed it over his blank face. Two quick squirts followed by a squeeze long enough to empty the whole tube. That's all it took. Suddenly the potential smile and bright eyes were replaced with an eternal scream. Looking back at me from my table were two sharp slits for eyes and a hungry mouth opened so wide that it bled into his blue suit. If you tattle, Chelsea Steeler said, in that dark cruel voice of hers, I will kill you. And then, as if she hadn't just crushed all my dreams, she walked back over to her desk without a care in the world. Mrs. Abassi continued reading her newspaper for a couple more minutes before she came around to collect our gingerbread creations to put in the oven. I didn't resist. I was still in shock from seeing my new friend getting disfigured in a senseless act of violence. A television was rolled into the room and the class was treated to the first three minutes of Pinocchio on a groaning VCR. The movie was barely audible past the excited whispers of my classmates about the imminent field trip, but I wasn't watching the screen anyway. My eyes stayed glued to the oven. Somewhere in that furnace of hot light buddies scars were becoming permanent. By the time the cookies were done no one cared about the movie or the baked treats. Conversation was solely focused on how excited everyone was to see the dinosaurs that would be on display in the museum. Hearing my classmates talk about how much fun they would have in a place denied to me by mother's religious fanaticism hurt worse than Chelsea Steeler's numbing punches, but it wasn't until I was handed the gingerbread boy's corpse that my heart truly broke. Mrs. Abbasi left me alone in the classroom, the tape of Pinocchio a flickering backdrop to my personal tragedy. I sat there, holding my only friend in the palm of my hand. His body was still warm from the oven, but his manic scream of a mouth sent chills down my spine. Buddy would forever be broken and I would forever be lonely. It was a mournful day in Candyland. Rain, real rain, fell from the sky like big swollen tears. The gummy bears on the ground shed all of their coloring and turned into amorphous blobs of gelatin, the ice cream tipped skyscrapers leaked watery milk all over the pavement and everything was sticky. All of the televisions had been turned off and the only thing that cut through the silence of the city were murmured condolences from the inhabitants as they gathered around me. The gingerbread boy might have been massacred, but I would always have them, they said. Candyland would be here for me in this tough time, they said. But then an infernal screech cut through the marshmallow hills. The long-legged creatures scarcely had time to turn before the intruders descended upon them. Within moments their mammary bodies were bursting dark red frosting across the fluffy white land. Pterodactyls descended from the sky. The cries of the infernal lizard birds on the horizon were soon joined by shrieks of panic from the streets of Candyland. Heavy hooves of beaked monstrosities shook the city at its foundation. The dinosaurs, the dinosaurs that I was forbidden to see in the real world were forcing their way into the safe haven of my imagination. And they were destroying it. Massive tails broke through the caramel glass windows of the storefront and sent sparkling electricity out into the wet world. Horns cut their way through innocent bystanders sending blood and candy spilling in the streets. The skyscrapers crumbled beneath the weight of blood prehistoric force. The rain had turned into a downpour. Clouds, real storm clouds, gathered above the city and pelted it with cold slugs of water and sharp lightning. 
Candyland shook with the sounds of thunder and destruction, but beyond the mayhem there was something else. Beyond the mayhem there were sobs. Back in my first grade classroom, with Pinocchio quietly begging to become a real boy on the television, I found myself crying. I didn't just cry because of the gingerbread boy, I didn't just cry because of the museum trip I was excluded from, I cried because there was no way out. Chelsea Steeler's fists would forever haunt me. Mother's screeching voice would forever haunt me. Candyland could never sustain their horrible, cruel presence in my life. I cried because I knew there was no escape from the life I was living. As I cried I held him in my hands like a scared child holds a safety blanket, as if he could help me, as if he could deliver me from my suffering, but I knew in my heart of hearts that he was just a disfigured cookie. Yet as the tears flowed onto the little gingerbread boy, a glint of movement grabbed my attention. The world beyond my eyes was shimmering beneath the wetness of my tears, but for a split second I thought I saw a twitch in the pinstripe suit. For a breathless moment I watched the gingerbread in my hands, searching for movement. Soon enough I didn't just see it, I felt it. With trembling hands and an unsteady mind I placed the body on my desk and watched. For the first time in my young life I made an active effort to suppress my imagination. Candyland wasn't real, gingerbread men could not come to life, there was no conceivable way for Buddy to be moving on his own. For a gentle moment of calm, I almost believed my own lies, but then, with a shaking groan, Buddy's red mouth twitched. Buddy, the disfigured gingerbread boy rasped through his impossible mouth, I am Buddy. The crimson slits on his face struggled to blink, but after a couple frantic twitches they were focused straight at me. With effort, the gingerbread boy pulled himself up to his unsteady feet and started to walk towards me. His arms were outstretched, his red mouth drooped across his torso. I am Buddy, he said, I am Buddy the gingerbread boy. Every muscle of my tiny being was seized with panic. I couldn't look away. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. Instead of a cry for help all I managed to let out was a terrified wheeze. With each crumb-filled step Buddy's footing became more confident. Soon enough he was marching towards me like the friendly gingerbread men that Mrs. Abassi would read us stories about in the library. But those gingerbread men were friendly and pretty. Buddy was neither. Buddy, he strained as he hopped off my desk and into my lap. I am Buddy, the gingerbread boy. My body continued to ignore all of my panic-riddled orders as Buddy started to crawl across the itchy sweater I was wearing. I was frozen in a frenzy of fear and the only thing I could manage to do was shake. Yet my convulsions did little to stop Buddy's progress, he just gripped my clothes tighter, tearing away clumps of fluff as he traveled up my body. His fingerless hands pinched my skin with every grab of flesh that he took, but soon enough his climb stopped. Buddy had his rough hands gripped around my throat. Each frenzied breath my body demanded became more difficult to grasp. I am Buddy. The gingerbread boy, he said, squeezing, and I love you. My heartbeat pushed against his unrelenting body, the world was becoming faint, I could feel myself drifting off. I gathered every ounce of energy I had and attempted to speak. You are hurting me, I managed to whimper. As if a spell had been broken the pressure on my throat immediately loosened and Buddy came tumbling down to the bottom of my sweater. For a moment he struggled in an embrace of wool, but soon enough his head peeked out. The red slits in his face looked up at me in adoration and his scream of a mouth raised into an apologetic smile. I am sorry, he said, sitting up, I do not mean to hurt you. I just want to be friends. Friends? I asked, my breath returning but the shock of his words making me breathless again, you want to be friends with me? Friends, he nodded. I love you and I love Candyland and I want to be your friend. His mouth still tore into his body and his eyes still looked like two sharp cuts of a knife, but somehow there was an affectionate air about the creature. He was completely deformed, but somewhere inside of that torn up face, I could see him. I could see Buddy. I would like to be your friend Buddy, I whispered, I would like it very much. Without a moment's hesitation Buddy scrambled up my sweater and back towards my neck, but this time he didn't choke me. This time he hugged me. I don't know what we talked about first. 
All I know is that we talked. We talked the same way that the other kids would sit and chat about the color of the sky, or how snowmen were neat, or what their favorite pizza topping was. My first conversation with a real friend was more calming than I could ever imagine. Yet as we chatted, our conversation drifted from life-affirming small talk to more painful topics. Every word I said about Chelsea Steeler or Mother drained the joyfulness out of the gingerbread boy's face. Soon enough the gaping hole in Buddy's chest wasn't smiling anymore. It had turned into a violent snarl. No one treats my friend like that, he yelled, his stretched mouth turning the shade of blood, you have to fight back. You can't let them hurt you like that. I asked him how I could fight back, how I could stop the constant barrage of sadness that the two brought into my life. I begged for an answer to my suffering. Buddy's slitted eyes furrowed into deep thought. A couple times the giant red spot at his core moved as if it was about to announce a plan but nothing came of it. I do not know, friend, he finally said, but together we can defeat them. Together we can rebuild Candyland and make life a song. Together, I whispered. Moments later the door to the classroom opened to a horde of happy kids clutching plastic dinosaurs. On any other occasion I would feel jealous of their toys and the fun afternoon they were so loudly chatting about, but with Buddy snugly sitting in my sweater I was completely content with what I had. When Mrs. Abassi started writing out our winter break assignments on the chalkboard I put Buddy next to my day planner. All of those books that we had to read, all of those art projects we had to start, I knew that I would work on them with my gingerbread friend by my side. Yet as I copied down the writing on the chalkboard I suddenly felt a push from the side. Before I knew what was happening I was lying on the floor. The other kids were quietly giggling. Chelsea Steeler had pushed me out of my chair. Mrs. Abassi turned around from the chalkboard and told me to keep my hijinks for after the bell rang and continued writing down the assigned reading. Not wanting to antagonize Chelsea before my walk back home, I didn't say anything. I figured if I just kept my head low for the next couple of minutes I would get to enjoy a winter break with Buddy, but I was wrong. As soon as I was back at my desk my heart skipped a beat. The gingerbread boy was gone from my table. Without a word Chelsea Steeler held up Buddy between two fingers. He was dangerously close to her monstrous jaw. I pleaded loud enough to get the attention of the other kids. Soon enough the whole class with the exception of Mrs. Abassi was watching our exchange. I begged Chelsea, I pleaded for Buddy's life, promising to do anything she wanted as long as she let him go. But in response she just smiled. Too bad I'm hungry, she said, in that dark voice of hers. And then she swallowed him whole. I have always been a quiet child, but when I saw my only friend disappear in that dark gullet I let out a scream that brought in concerned faculty from other classrooms. My heart exploded in a white hot rage. I yelled at Chelsea calling her every bad word that I had picked up over the years, and even some that I made up on the spot, but in response she just smiled. I breathlessly explained what happened to Mrs. Abassi, but in response she just asked Chelsea if I was telling the truth. No. Chelsea said, in that dark voice of hers, she's making it all up. I yelled for the other kids, pleading for someone to take my side, begging for someone to tell the truth, but everyone just looked down on their shoelaces. Chelsea Steeler was not known for being kind to snitches. No one wanted to get hurt on my account. Everyone here is lying. Especially Chelsea Steeler. I yelled in exasperation. This did not sit well with Chelsea. For a split second I could see her dark eyes burrowing into me, vowing revenge, but soon enough they disappeared beneath a curtain of tears. I was crying again, but this time they weren't quiet sobs, this time I wailed hard enough for my throat to hurt. I tried going back to Candyland but there was nothing left for me to go back to. The city was a collection of smashed glass and bent candy canes. Not a soul was left to greet me or talk to me, even the dinosaurs had left. All that remained of my daydream kingdom was a wet sticky wasteland. Mrs. Abassi made me sit out in the hallway until the final bell rang because I was deemed distracting to the class, but once everyone in the grade had left the classroom she invited me in. There was exhaustion in her eyes, but somewhere past the tiredness there was understanding. 
She said she knew Chelsea was a problematic classmate, and that regardless of what happened I deserved to be able to have my own gingerbread man. There was still some dough and a couple tubes of frosting that I could take home for winter break. I knew mother would never let me make a mockery of God's image in the oven, and I was still recovering from the heartbreak of losing Buddy, but Mrs. Abassi's gift was a gentle band-aid for my broken soul. That band-aid did not stay for long. Moments after I left school, just as I was starting to daydream about how I would bake a new gingerbread boy in the middle of the night, I felt a sharp pain in my jaw. Before I knew what was happening I was lying on the pavement with a loose milk tooth rattling in my mouth. No one calls me a liar, she said, in that dark voice of hers. With the sun burning behind her she looked like a fiery giant. 